Welcome everyone to this latest Science AAAS webinar, Charting the Human Proteome, Understanding Disease Using a Tissue-Based Atlas. I'm so pleased that everyone could join us on the line today. My name is Sean Sanders and I'm editor for Custom Publishing at Science. In probably one of the biggest mapping projects undertaken since the Human Genome Project, a multinational research project recently launched an open source tissue-based interactive map of the human proteome called the Human Protein Atlas. It has taken a team of multidisciplinary researchers using a combination of several omics technologies over 1,000 person years to compile the searchable open source database comprising 13 million annotated images of human tissues mapped down to the single cell level. The interactive database is aimed at researchers interested in basic research into human biology as well as those working in translational medicine. In this webinar, two of the researchers involved in this program will provide their insights regarding the lessons learned from this, this intensive effort to map the human proteome. It is my pleasure to introduce those speakers to you right now. They are Dr. Matthias, Matthias Uhlen from uh, the Royal Institute of Technology in Stockholm, Sweden, and Dr. C Cecilia Lindskrug from Uppsala University in Uppsala, Sweden. Dr. Ullen is Director of the Science for Life Laboratory Sweden and has more than 500 publications in bioscience with a focus on the development and use of affinity reagents in biotechnology and biomedicine. He has founded 10 companies and has more than 70 patents and patent applications. Dr. Ullen was the first to describe the use of affinity tags for purification of proteins, a principle now widely used. He was also instrumental in starting the international effort to create the Human Protein Atlas with the aim of systematically mapping the entire human proteome. Dr. Linskrug is a researcher at Uppsala University where she focuses mainly on affinity proteomics and the analysis of expression patterns in normal and diseased tissues using techniques such as RNA-seq, immunohistochemistry, and tissue microarrays. Dr. Linskrug is Deputy Site Director of the Tissue Atlas and Protein Profiling Division of the Human Protein Atlas and has also has experience in the biotechnology industry. Uh, thank you so much, uh, both of you, for being with us here today. Uh, you will notice the absence of Dr. Frederick Ponton, who unfortunately could not join us today due to some urgent personal issues, but Dr. Ullen has kindly agreed to step in on his behalf. Uh, before we get started with the presentations, I'd like to share some information quickly with our online viewers. At the top right of the screen, you'll find photographs of today's speakers and a view bio link which you can click to read more details about their background and research. Underneath the slide viewer is the resources tab where you can find additional information about technologies related to today's discussion and the link to download a PDF of the slides. After the speaker's presentations, we will have a short Q&A session during which they will address some of the questions submitted by our live online viewers. So if you're joining us live, start thinking about some questions now and submit them at any time by clicking the Ask a Question button below the slide window and typing the question into the message box, then clicking OK. You can also log into your Facebook, Twitter, or LinkedIn accounts during the webinar to post updates or send tweets about the event. Just click the relevant icon at the top right of the screen. For tweets, you can add the hashtag hash science webinar. Finally, thank you to Atlas Antibodies for sponsoring today's webinar. Now, I'd like to pass the microphone over to Dr. Ullen to get us started. Uh, Dr. Ullen, a very warm welcome and thanks for being with us. Thank you very much, Dr. Sanders. Uh, and a warm welcome to all of you that are listening to this webinar. What we would like to do then is to give you a short introduction to the human protein atlas, talk about the human subproteomes, and then continue and talk a little bit more specifically about different tissue and organ proteomes, uh, and then have some uh, concluding remarks. Uh, the seminar today then will be very much based on the article that came in the end of January in Science uh, called Tissue-Based Map of the Human Proteome. Uh, and what we will describe in this webinar is some of the insights that we learned from mapping of the human proteome. Um, so uh, as an introduction, um, I would like then to say a few words about the protein atlas. 
Uh, it is uh, started about 12 years ago. It's a joint effort with the main players in Sweden and in Asia, South Korea, China, and India. It is funded by a non-profit organization called the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation. And so far, we have spent about 1,000 person years on this uh, project. Um, so uh, the, what we're trying to do in this first part of the Protein Atlas, and I will come back to what we want to do in the future, is what we call spatial proteomics. That is, where are the proteins uh, in the different parts of the human body? We are mainly using an antibody-based analysis in nuclear chemistry, uh, and one of the really great advantages with this method is that we can go down to the single cell resolution uh, and also see the expression of proteins in the context of neighboring cells. And, and we can also do this in a rather comprehensive manner. Uh, we are using, as I said, immunistic chemistry that allows us to analyze organs, tissues, and also cells. Uh, but then we are also using, uh, with the same antibodies, uh, immunofluorescence and confocal microscopy to go down to the more organelle level. Uh, the uh, progress of the Human Protein Atlas since the first release in 2005, you can see on this uh, PowerPoint, uh, it is uh, the number of genes uh, in blue and the number of antibodies that we used in red. Uh, and we now have uh, covered most of the protein-coded genes on the human uh, genome uh, with antibodies and analysis. Uh, the, um, the, all the antibodies uh, that are used in, the, in, in this effort, uh, you can find validation data on the protein atlas. In this case, these are three proteins to the very well-known protein P53. You can see where the antibody comes from, what is the provider, uh, the purification strategy used in, in, in this case. And also for some of the antibodies, we also provide the antigen information. Uh, and then there's also a possibility then to uh, explore the, the standardized uh, validations that we're using, in particular Western blot assays and other types of assays using standard assays. Um, so this allows everyone to go and see what is the validation used for the different antibodies used in this effort. We also have a page where we, uh, we actually show for all the antibodies provided in-house, what we call the HPA antibodies. Uh, we also show the, where are the, uh, the antigens uh, on the protein, uh, and also we show uh, different types of analysis of the corresponding proteins, and I don't have time to go into this in detail. Uh, the, one of the science ways and new ways to analyze assays, if you use both siRNA or CRISPR, uh, and we have started an effort now to go through the antibodies and use these new ways of knocking down the genes to validate the antibody further. And uh, this is very, very exciting. So in the tissue-based atlas and the uh, article in Science that just came out, uh, we have used immunistic chemistry and we used tissue microarrays. Uh, the, the focus is on 32 tissues where we have both RNA and protein data, and these t uh, tissues cover uh, all the major tissues and organs in the human body. We also have 12 additional tissues where we only have protein data, and altogether, the uh, pathologists that have looked through these images uh, are annotating then protein expression in 83 different normal cell types. Uh, altogether, we now have 13 million annotated images. They have all been annotated by a pathologist. It's altogether 576 uh, images per antibody, and this can then be explored in the, in the protein atlas for all the genes that we are covering. Uh, 
We are also doing transcriptomics, and this has been a very good complement to the the data on the protein level. Uh, We are then using the FPKM value, which corresponds to about one mRNA molecule per cell. Uh, And here you can see the tissues that are covered with RNA and protein data, and also only with the protein data. The, um, all, all the data from the RNA and protein expression is summarized on, on the gene pages. Uh, and without going into the details here, we, I show here a heart-specific protein where you see a bar corresponding to the heart uh, in, in the lower part to the left, uh, both on the RNA level to the left and on the protein level on the right. Uh, on the right, you see a more housekeeping type of protein, which is expressed in all the tissues, and this is a ribosomal protein. So by exploring this, you can get a very quick view of where are your protein in the different parts of the human body. Uh, the, the expression on the RNA level has also allowed us then to classify all the human protein coded genes according to the gene expression in the different parts of the human body. And we have about 2,300 genes which are uh, expressed in a tissue-enriched manner. Uh, And then we have some other uh, genes which are expressed in a group-enriched manner. We have about 44% of the genes which are expressed in all tissues that we analyze. Uh, and, and and so on. So this then allows us then to classify all the genes according to how they are expressed in the different parts of the human body. Uh, this also allows us then to have a, a sort of a network plot showing how many tissue-enriched genes we have in the different parts of the human body, in the, in the testes, in the brain, in the kidney, and so on but also uh, genes which uh, has a group-enriched expression that is a shared elevated expression in two or more tissues. Uh, I just show you one example of a group-enriched gene. This is the CDHR2 uh, gene. Uh, and what you can then see on the protein level, but also on the RNA level, that this is a protein which is expressed in the different parts of the, of the gastrointestinal tract, uh, as shown here of the expression in both the duodenum and small intestine. Uh, the version 13 of the Human Protein Atlas was released in November 7. Uh, it then contains the first draft of the complete tissue atlas. Uh, but I think also what is very nice is that it contains landing pages for human tissues and organs with numerous lists that is, could be explored by the user. And uh, this, this atlas is then free of charge and has no restriction, and it's an open source resource. We cover about uh, 90% of the protein-coded genes and a little bit more than 85% of the protein-coded genes. Uh, Apart from the tissue atlas that we will focus on here, we also have an atlas of cancer tissue, a cell line atlas, but also a subcellular atlas showing where are the proteins and the different uh, parts of of the cell. Uh, we released together in, in a collaboration with Science a poster, uh, and this is available at the URL that you can see in the lower part of, of the slide. Uh, and this then is a poster that is available uh, and shows a little bit the insight that we got from mapping the human proteome. The, uh, what I will then talk a little bit more about is some of the human subproteomes that are uh, interesting uh, in, in, in many ways, and then go through them one by one. Uh, but if you want to know more about this, you should then go to the Protein Atlas and explore these specific chapters. Uh, and then Cecilia Lin School will then go in and talk more about the human tissue and organ proteomes. So if we then move to the human subproteomes, um, then we start with the housekeeping proteomes, which is obviously the proteins that we find are expressed in all tissues. 44% of the human protein-coded genes 
uh, at least in our hands, seems to be expressed in all the tissues that we analyze. And many of those genes are obviously genes coding for metabolism, protein synthesis, structural integrity, cell division, and so on. And an interesting part of this is the mitochondrial proteins. Here we see an example of that, the MTCO1 uh, gene. Uh, and uh, the, the um, summary to the left shows that this uh, protein is expressed in all the different t tissues and cells that we analyzed. But you can also see that there are a little bit differences in amounts. For example, there's quite a lot of expression in the heart, which is not so surprising since we know that we have a very uh, high energy metabolism in the heart. This can also be seen if we look at the genes which are coding for mitochondrial genes. Uh, so this is the uh, fraction of, of the transcripts coming from the mitochondrial genes in different tissues. And again, what you can see then is the highest bar is uh, in the middle. Uh, you can see it's coming from the, uh, from the heart, where more than 30% of the transcript in the heart is coding for mitochondrial proteins. The second highest one is the skeletal muscle, and this clearly shows that these two tissues uh, have a very high energy metabolism. Uh, the uh, second subprotein that I want to say a few words about is the regulatory proteome. It's a very interesting uh, 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 subproteome with about 1,500 transcription factors. And uh, uh, if you look at where these 1,500 genes are expressed, and this is a rather complicated slide, uh, but what you can see here is where they are, uh, w w the, the amount of these genes in the different parts of the human body. Uh, and the color then shows if they are expressed in all or if they are more tissue uh, restricted. And what you can see very clearly is that a lot of the genes here are blue, which means that a lot of the transcription factors are expressed in all the tissues, which is somewhat of a surprise for us. Um, this is just one example of one of these transcription factors which actually do show a tissue restricted uh, um, uh, expression where we have most of the transcription factor found in the skin and the esophagus uh, while it's much less in other tissues. Uh, an interesting subproteome are the secretome and the membrane proteome. Uh, and uh, the, we have used different uh, uh, bioinformatics algorithms to explore how many of the proteins are in the different parts of the, the, uh, of the human body. And what you can see here is, uh, is that our prediction says that there is about 3,000 genes encoding secreted proteins, uh, and there is another 5,500 5, genes encoding membrane-bound proteins. And these uh, genes are, of course, very interesting for all of us that are interested in medical applications since they are very often used as drug targets. Um, so uh, let's see now. I'm going to move forward uh, to the next slide. Uh, this is again a an, an slide showing the transcription levels and localization of all the tissue-enriched genes with 2,355 genes. And again, this is a rather complicated slide, but the color here shows uh, the, the, uh, where are the, uh, these tissue-enriched genes uh, localized in the different parts of the human body, and you can see a large uh, part in, in the right corner, which is the testis genes, where you have a yellow color, which so most of them are intracellular, while in the middle of this slide, you have the pancreas and the salivary gland, which has a lot of secreted proteins, which are tissue enriched, and then you have the brain to the left, where you have a lot of red dots. Uh, symbolizing or representing genes which are membrane bound. So there are clear differences in, in how, where the localization of the tissue rich genes in the different parts of the human body. 
The next slide is uh, uh, the druggable proteome. This is a very interesting list of 620 separate human proteins that are directed, directly related to mechanism action for, for some of the drugs that you find in the, in the pharmacy. Uh, most of these uh, drugs are small molecular drugs, but there are also recently quite a few biological drugs that are out on the market. What we learned from this is that about almost 60% of the drug targets of today's drugs are predicted membrane proteins, and, and uh, it's interesting to see that the current drug targets are only 3% of the human proteins. Okay. Um, again, uh, the next slide here shows where the drug targets are uh, in the different uh, parts of the human body. And again, you can see that uh, quite a few of these drug targets are, uh, has a blue color. That means that they are expressed in all tissue types. And as a matter of fact, about 30% of the drug targets we find in all parts of the human body. Um, uh, this is just one example of that. This is that uh, this is a very common, well uh, used uh, drug target called COM COMT. And the examples of drugs targeting this this protein is is for Parkinson's disease and other types of diseases. And what you can f see here is that this protein, according to the protein atlas, is expressed in more or less all the tissues in the human body. And obviously, this might have consequences for, for the drug development. An interesting subprotein are the isoform protein. Uh, we don't have time to go through this in detail, but simply to say that a large fraction of the human genes encode multiple splice variants. And these are, of course, very interesting to explore further. Um, and then finally, I just want to say a little bit about the cancer proteome. There are several uh, lists of proteins which have been implicated in cancers. And by going then to the protein atlas, you can then see where are they expressed in the different parts of the human body. Uh, but you can also then see uh, the heterogeneity of these uh, proteins in different cancers as uh, as illustrated here by some well-known cancer uh, proteins, and also on the next slide showing some examples of proteins which we know is implicated in cancer. Um, so um, uh, you can also explore maybe some little bit less known uh, genes which have been implicated in cancer, like the FOXA1, which seems to be it's a transcription factor. It's enhanced in prostate, but it's also mutated in prostate cancer. So uh, using this, then, you can then go and explore the different uh, subproteins of the human body. So now I think it's time for us to discuss the tissue-specific proteome. So I will then hand over to uh, Dr. Cecilia Linskog, who will go through some of the insights that we learn from the tissue and organ proteomes. Thank you, Dr. Lin. I will now continue to talk about the tissue and organ proteome. Approximately 34% of the genes were shown to be elevated in at least one tissue type. And these elevated genes are further subdivided into three uh, subgroups, tissue-enriched genes, group-enriched genes, and tissue-enhanced genes. And the organ system that had the highest number of tissue-elevated genes was male tissues, and particularly testis. And if we look at uh, the sum of FPKM values on the bars to the right, uh, where we see the fraction of transcripts from the elevated genes, we see that despite the male tissues have a very high number of tissue elevated genes, these genes constitute only a small proportion of the total number of transcripts that are expressed in male tissues. And this means that many of the elevated genes have relatively low abundance. But in contrast, if we look, for example, at pancreas that have relatively a small number of tissue elevated genes, the elevated genes constitute a majority of the transcripts that are expressed in pancreas. And this is because pancreas uh, elevated genes encode many secreted proteins that have very high abundance. 
if we combine the transcriptomics data with immunohistochemistry, we were able to identify proteins that were selectively expressed in a certain organ type as compared with all the other organs. And here are some examples of proteins selectively expressed in a selection of normal tissues. On the Human Protein Atlas portal, there are 27 different chapters where we describe the proteins and genes that are expressed in different organs and tissues more in detail. And these comprehensive chapters have clickable lists with direct links into the Human Protein Atlas where we see the original immunohistochemistry images and also all the annotation data and validation data of the antibodies that we used. And the chapters also include information on the organ function and histology for learning purposes. The organ proteome that had the highest number of elevated genes is testis, where almost 2,000 genes were elevated as compared with other tissue types. And most of the proteins that were encoded by enriched genes are involved in spermatogenesis. And we also saw that a majority of the group enriched genes shared expression with fallopian tube. And this is expected since the ciliated cells in fallopian tube and the sperm's intestines have common functions with regard to cell motility. When we combine the transcriptomics data with the immunohistochemistry data on the human protein atlas, we were able to identify staining patterns and proteins that were selectively expressed in various stages of the spermatogenesis, such as proteins expressed in spermatogonia, spermatocytes, spermatids, and sperms. And as you can see, we not only see the cell types where the protein is expressed, we also see the subcellular localization of the staining pattern as, for example, in the bottom image of TEX101, we see clear cytoplasmic expression in spermatocytes. Another example is the heart-specific proteome. And in heart, almost 300 genes were elevated as compared with other tissue types. And most of the proteins that were encoded by the heart-enriched genes are involved in muscle contraction. And not unexpectedly, a large number of genes were simultaneously elevated in heart and skeletal muscle that is also a striated muscle. As Dr. Erlen mentioned, a large fraction of the transcripts are encoded by mitochondrial genes, and this is the highest number of any of the analyzed tissues, which demonstrates uh, the importance of the heart muscle to provide energy for the continuous contraction. By combining the transcriptomic analysis with immunohistochemistry data, we identify several proteins with different functions that were expressed through various expression patterns in heart muscle. And here you clearly see the advantage of immunohistochemistry, where you can identify different types of staining patterns, as for example, cytoplasmic staining, membrane staining. AKPI6 also showed uh, staining in nuclear membranes and nesting in blood vessels. And on the bottom of the image, you see four proteins that were selectively expressed in intercalated discs. And there were also several proteins that were group enriched in heart and skeletal muscle. And here are some examples with different functions. And also here we see different types of staining patterns, as for example, the first one, MIH7, there we can see differential expression between different types of uh, muscle fibers in skeletal muscle. So here only type 1 muscle fibers are stained while the type 2 muscle fibers are negative. And we were also able to identify some proteins with an unknown function in muscle. And since these are it's expressed mainly in muscle and not in other tissues. It can be anticipated that these have an important function in muscle physiology. And by providing lists with tissue-elevated genes in this manner and combine it with the immunohistochemistry data on the single cell level, we provide the basis for future research to understand the molecular events that occur in normal and diseased tissues 
and the tissue elevated genes may potentially be studied further in clinical cohorts and may be used as potential biomarkers for, for example, disease stratification. Here's a list of the 12 genes that had highest level of enriched expression in heart. And the gene that had highest FPK value was NPPA, natriuretic peptide A. And if we look into the human protein atlas, we saw a distinct cytoplasmic staining with a granular pattern in heart muscle, while OMS negative in all other analyzed tissues. And this also fits very well with the RNA sequencing data with a very high FPK value in heart muscle and close to zero in the other analyzed tissues. And NPPA is a well-known uh, protein associated with heart homeostasis functions, and it's also used as a diagnostic and prognostic marker for heart failure. Another example is myosin light chain 7, which is part of the myosin family associated with contraction. And also this protein was distinctly expressed in heart muscle while negative in all the other tissues and the expression was similar also on the RNA DEC level. For MIL7, we used three different antibodies and we have immunistic chemistry data displayed for all of these three antibodies that were used on the human protein atlas. And for each tissue that is analyzed, we look at three different individuals. So in this case, we have nine different PMA cores where we have immunohistochemically stained images. And for all images on the human protein atlas, it is possible to zoom in to look at the immunohistochemical staining more in detail. And here we see distinct cytoplasmic expression in cardiomyocytes. For all genes with RNA sequencing data, we provide the information on the transcripts, and we also show the FPK and value, values for all the individual samples that were analyzed. And here, for example, for heart muscle and the still the gene myosin light chain 7, we see that there was a little bit differential expression pattern. So sample 2 had an FPK and value of 500 FPK and while sample 4 had an FPK value of a bit more than 14,000. It is also possible to view all the samples more in detail. We provide the hematoxylin and eosin stain frozen sections of the samples that we used for RNA sequencing. And we have also done an estimation of the cell types that are included in the sample. And as expected, uh, heart muscle not only contains myocytes, but also fibroblasts, endothelial cells, and other cell types, such as, for example, adipocytes. And all of these cell types, of course, also contribute to the total mRNA pool of that particular sample. A group of tissues that had many group-enriched genes was the gastrointestinal tract. And here's an example of a protein that was group enriched in the intestinal tract, CDX2. It showed distinct nuclear expression in colon, duodenum, small intestine, and rectum, while it was negative in stomach and also in other analyzed tissues. And also on the RNA level, we see FPK values of around 50 to 60 in the intestinal tract, while almost zero in other normal organs. And it is also possible for many of the genes to look in the other subatlases to get a complete view of the protein of interest. As for example, here in uh, the cancer atlas, we see that highest expression was observed in colorectal cancer for CDX2. And CDX2 is also used as a diagnostic marker for colorectal cancer in the clinic. And if we look into the cell line atlas, we see distinct nuclear staining in the CACO2 cell line, uh, which is a colon adenocarcinoma cell line. And in the cell line atlas, we also have RNA sequencing data from 44 different cell lines. And then it's also possible to go into the subcellular atlas to look at the uh, subcellular localization more in detail. And also here we use the CACO2 cell line and see the antibody in green showing distinct nuclear staining in nucleus, but not in nucleoli. And now I will hand over to Dr. Ulin for some final conclusions and future perspectives. 
thank you very much, Dr. Lindskog. Uh, so, uh, as I said already, there are some conclusions from the tissue-based atlas uh, and uh, about the housekeeping protein, the tissue-specific protein, and the drug abort protein. Um, and uh, obviously, what we would like to do now is then to use the same approach for a more uh, uh, effort in the brain and we will hopefully then uh, produce a brain atlas later this year and then next year we are planning to release a subcellular atlas to show where are the proteins located in cell to cell and in a more complete manner and then obviously it's interesting to move over to the pathology side but also to see what are the proteins in the plasma um, so, um, uh, in, uh, as a closing, then I would like to uh, thank the people that have been, uh, or the organization that have been funding this. This has been a very uh, uh, funded from many different sources. Uh, but maybe I should just thank the, the Knut and Alice Wallenberg Foundation for the main funding for for this uh, effort. Uh, and um, then I just want to thank also all the people that have been involved in this. This has been a real team effort from many, many different countries, uh, and I'm very grateful for this team to produce this atlas, which is now an open source resource for everyone interested in human biology and medicine. Uh, so with that, I just want to uh, end by uh, giving uh, uh, some information about the, the Science and Science Life Prize for Young Scientists, that we have a collaboration with the science and, and the AAAS. Uh, this is an annual prize that started in 2013. One competes with the thesis, uh, doctoral thesis, in four areas of life science and the prize winners are selected by the science editorial board, is then invited to the Nobel Week in Stockholm in the end of December, but also the winner assets will be published in science. So if you know uh, or if you have a very good thesis that have been produced in the last two years, please submit it to the uh, Science and SciLife Lab prize. Um, and uh, finally, I then just want to thank you all for listening, and then I will hand over back to Dr. Sanders for the Q&A session. Thank you very much. Fantastic. Thank you so much, Dr. Ullen and uh, Dr. Lindskog for the uh, wonderful presentation. So we're going to move right on to the questions submitted by our live online viewers. Uh, just a quick reminder to those watching us live that you can still submit your questions by clicking the Ask a Question button below the slide window and typing the question into the message box and then clicking OK. So we have had quite a few questions in. Um, I'm going to, uh, I think, start off with um, one that I think is just a very basic question, and I'm, um, Dr. Linskog, I think I'll, I'll pass this one to you. Um, this view asks what the difference is between a tissue-enriched gene and tissue-elevated gene. Could you uh, clarify? Yes. Uh, we call the three subgroups tissue-enriched, group-enriched, and uh, tissue-enhanced. These three together we call tissue-elevated genes and tissue enriched are expressed at least five times higher in a particular tissue as compared with all other analyzed tissues. And group enriched uh, are the same, but then it's a group of two to seven tissues. And then we also have tissue enhanced, uh, where the expression in a particular tissue is at least five times higher than the mean of all the other analyzed tissues. Excellent. Thank you for that. Um, let me stay with you for another question that came in during your presentation, and this asks uh, why there are some cases where you cannot detect um, messenger RNA in some tissues, but you can detect the protein. Uh, yes. Uh, we have an arbitrary cutoff level of 0 0.5 FPKM, and we have seen a few genes where it's just below that, and we can still see that also on uh, the protein level. Excellent. And maybe I uh, can also comment on that, uh, Dr. Sure. Sanders. Uh, obviously, some of the uh, staining that we see on the protein level will also be cross-reactivity, and we are very aware that some of our antibodies in some situation and in some context actually shows 
staining, which is actually uh, background staining. So if you have a staining of the protein and no RNA, this is a warning that this might not uh, actually be a specific staining. And this is obviously something that we would like to clean up in the next few years so we know and try to uh, clean up this and, and remove those antibodies that shows this kind of cross-reactivity. And this is particularly difficult for proteins which are very low abundant. Uh, and uh, this is something that uh, I think you're all aware of that antibodies in some contexts might give you cross-reactivity. Great, and that, that actually leads into a couple of questions that I received on that topic. Uh, the first is, um, how often do you find antibodies to different domains of a given protein show different expression patterns by uh, immunohistochemistry? chemistry? Um, so do you know whether these represent tube tubeology or, or possibly cross-reactivity? Well, that's a very good question, and we actually uh, try to then develop at least two antibodies to every protein uh, and try to, define, uh, to make them uh, recognizing different parts, different epitopes of the target protein, and then we compare the staining of these two antibodies. And for us, then, this is a very good sign if we get the same staining that we have a, a specific staining. Uh, but in some cases, we find that they are different staining, and this could, of course, be that they are recognizing different isoforms, splice variants of the protein, but it also might be a sign that this is uh, at least one of the stainings then is not specific. So this is a, a very good, a, a good um, validation for us. And in the end of this project, we hope to then have at least two antibodies recognizing every protein uh, uh, in, in the human body then. So we, uh, we had a question in, uh, from uh, actually one of the speakers in a previous science webinar that we did on antibody validation. Um, and he was asking uh, about what percentage of antibodies have been validated using knockout or progressive expression, um, and how have you validated them with respect to reproducibility? So perhaps you could talk a little bit more about that, because I know that is a concern amongst a lot of scientists. Yes, as I mentioned in, in, in my part then, that we are a very big believer of gene knockouts using siRNA or shRNA or CRISPR, uh, and then compare them the staining of a specific antibody when before and after you have knocked down their genes. So far, we have only about 400 uh, genes where we have done this, which is now in the open resource in the Protein Atlas. Uh, but certainly this is something that we would like also the community to participate uh, so uh, to, to actually uh, use that as a validation of the antibodies that we use. And our, our, what we, our long term aim then is to only use antibodies where we have shown a positive knockdown of the corresponding gene then and, 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 and so on. But so far it's only 400 out of the more than 20,000 uh, antibodies that has been analyzed in this manner. So I'm going to uh, send a question to Dr. Linskog uh, now. Um, and this viewer says uh, protein expression is dynamic during the cell cycle and also changes um, under different conditions. Can you comment on this and how it might uh, impact the uh, protein atlas? Um, yes. Uh, we don't analyze the protein in particularly in the different stages of the cell cycle uh, other than looking in the tissues and how we see the expression in the different tissues. Um, uh, but uh, that could, of course, be studied more in detail in cell lines. And I think Dr. Ulian has more comments about this. So this is a very interesting question, and we are very interested in the cell cycle dependent proteins. And as a matter of fact, one of the main uh, projects in the subcellular atlas, uh, which is led by Dr. Emma Lundberg, and it's a separate uh, uh, project, uh, we have then used the staining to actually uh, identify the proteins which are cell cycle dependent and are now uh, 
thinking about or, or, or organizing a list of the proteins which are cell cycle dependent. And on that topic, do you, do you use multiple different samples from different individuals to see if the expression is the same? Yes, we use, uh, for every tissue that is used in uh, the tissue atlas, we use samples from three different individuals. And we have done some pilot studies where we compare the expression between different individuals. And as far as we have seen so far, there is not so much uh, difference in expression between different ages or uh, uh, different individuals that maybe had different background diseases. It's, it's quite consistent between these three samples for most of the genes. Excellent. Um, the next question uh, is uh, regarding the, your threshold for what you see as positive expression. So uh, in immunohistochemistry, chemistry, sometimes you will have maybe very light staining. What sort of threshold do you use uh, to categorize a tissue as positive or negative? Uh, we have decided on a, a calibration that is used for all the pathologies that have been annotating the images. So we always uh, use the same intensity as the threshold. And we also divide the positivity into weak, moderate, and strong staining. And sometimes when it's very weak, it's difficult to say if it's background or if it's real positivity. And uh, if it is a light brown, then it is scored as a positive. Uh, but when we use two different antibodies for the same gene, we do something that we call annotated protein expression. And then we do a combined annotation for these two or more antibodies that we used to uh, uh, score this protein. And then we have the possibility to do a knowledge-based scoring. And then we can also remove what we think is obvious background staining it to only show what we think is true protein expression. And, and uh, Matthias here, I also want to just add uh, to this then that the immunostochemistry that we use is not of course quantitative, it is an amplification method that we use. So what we can see here is, is sort of relative abundance of, 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 of the particular protein across the different tissues. Um, but if we get a very good spatial resolution. On the contrary then, on the RNA side with the transcriptomics and the RNA-seq, we get a very quantitative measurement. But obviously here we're using a mixture of cell types, uh, so we cannot really distinguish uh, if the, what is sort of contributing from the different cell types. And uh, this is, of course, one of the reasons why we think the integration of the transcriptomics with the antibody-based protein profiling is so excellent because you get the quantification from the RNA and then you get the spatial resolution from the protein data. Perfect. Uh, so, um, Dr. Ullen, let me stay with you for the next question. Uh, since uh, fixatives can often have uh, quite a, um, a profound effect on the uh, immunistic chemical staining, um, can you talk about what sort of fixatives uh, you use in your work? I will actually hand this over to Dr. Linskog, who's, who's handling this. Sure. Uh, thank you. We only use paraffin embedded formalin fixed uh, tissue samples for all. Uh, the tissues that we have used for immunity chemistry in the tissue atlas. And we have done some pilot studies with other fixatives, but we uh, didn't find that appropriate for this large-scale analysis we are using. And we get all uh, the tissues in uh, collaboration with the pathology department, and most of uh, their samples are paraffin-embedded uh, from their archive that we get. Okay. Great, because the, the viewer who asked this question said that they, they found that the particular protein that they're interested in is not well represented when using um, formalin fixed tissue. Um, so I, I was wondering if there is any um, plans to look at different fixatives and certain specific proteins that maybe are not detectable under formalin fixation. 
Yes, we could definitely uh, do that uh, further on, and we would also like to try other antigen retrieval for antibodies that we think show uh, some cross-reactivity with the standard setup that we are using, because now we use mainly the same protocol for all the antibodies, but we would like to improve the protocol and for certain antibodies that may work better with the other protocols and that we could of course also do with the tissue fixatives for certain proteins that would benefit from that in the future. So that actually brings me nicely to another question on um, uh, related to the subject and that is uh, how many antigens do you not see in the tissues that you investigate that you expect to see and are there plans to include some more exotic tissues in your analysis and this viewer was specifically thinking of retinal tissue which is something that he works on. Yes, uh, on the RNA sequencing side there are 9% of the genes that were not identified in any of the 32 tissues that were analyzed with RNA sequencing and uh, we also plan to add more uh, tissues on the protein side in the future. We actually have a list of genes already, uh, approximately 100 genes, where we are looking at more specialized tissues, for example, retina and uh, cornea and other parts of the eye, and we also have more specialized regions of the brain and taste buds and some other tissues, and hopefully we'll also get access to some uh, fetal tissues in the future to look more into developmental genes and this we plan to add in uh, some of the upcoming releases in the future. Right, uh, Dr. Ullen, I think this uh, might be a good question for you. Uh, this is, uh, I believe, a, a question on actually searching the database uh, and this uh, viewer asks if there's a way to easily search for the expression of a given protein within a specific cell type in the tissue. For instance, can they get a comprehensive list of all proteins that have high expression, say in fibroblasts, but not in melanocytes or keratinocytes? Uh, all the data on the Human Protein Atlas is downloadable, so you can get all uh, the data from uh, cell types that are, have been scored by the pathologist in a large uh, Excel file, and then you can organize that uh, yourself to ask different questions on the data so you could get a complete data set from everything. Okay, fantastic. Um, the next question is uh, on the druggable proteome um, and um, this view asks if a drug target is a good target if it's expressed in every tissue and uh, what are your criteria for identifying a, a protein as a drug target? Well, in this case, we have not. Uh, the, uh, we have only basically looked at the FDA-approved uh, drugs, and then we've just provided a list of the 620 uh, proteins that are targeted by these drugs. Um, and uh, for us, obviously, uh, it is interesting then uh, to then go to the more tissue-enriched proteins in different tissues, and also maybe the membrane proteins which uh, at least so far has been good uh, targets for, 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 for drug development. But I see maybe the main use of this in this field is that when a, uh, an academic researcher or a pharma researcher are exploring a, a, a possible drug target, one can go then to the protein atlas and then say, where is this protein in the different parts of the human body? And maybe sometimes you get surprises that you think that this is a protein specific for the kidney or the liver, but you can also see that it is expressed in other parts of the human body. And this might have relevance uh, for, for, for what side effects a, a possible future drug would have. So I think this is useful in the early part of drug developments. Uh, but obviously, I think that if you're interested in uh, kidney disease, it might be interesting to look at the list of proteins which are uh, more or less exclusively expressed in the kidney and so on. Uh, and before I, I just end this question, I also want to say that we kind of avoid the wording tissue specific, which is very much used in the literature. We use the word tissue enriched and tissue enhanced and group enriched, 
Uh, and the reason for avoiding tissue specific is that it is somewhat of a definition what is the cutoff, uh, but also we find very, very few proteins which are exp uh, ex uh, expressed exclusively in only one tissue. Uh, one of the surprises, I think, with the project is that we find proteins uh, also in, uh, even if it's highly expressed in one tissue, we very often see it also expressed in other tissues. Excellent. Um, are you planning on looking at uh, the phosphorylation status of the protein? Um, uh, in other words, are there any projects that will maybe maybe you have a, a phospho subproteome in the future? Yeah, that's a very interesting question, and obviously a lot of the magic of uh, human biology, but also other types of uh, animal biology, is of course uh, the pathways and the modifications uh, of proteins that activate and inactivates proteins. Uh, it is very hard to get uh, hold of antibodies which are, uh, which are modification specific and also works in immunistic chemistry. Uh, so our approach for this is uh, that we identify what are the proteins we hopefully then can give uh, advice to researchers what is a good antibody, and then I think the best way to do this is a combination of technologies, and maybe the most uh, interesting one is to use antibodies to capture out your protein and then use mass spectrometry and proteomics to look at the modifications. Uh, but we don't have any plans right now uh, for making a sort of a modification uh, specific proteome uh, atlas uh, simply for the fact that many of these proteins they don't work very well in immunistic chemistry in our hands I should say. Mm -hmm. Good. Um, next question is um, what have you observed as far as the correlation between transcription and translation? Do you Do you see a strong correlation in the data? Yeah, that's also, of course, a very interesting question, and it's a very controversial in the scientific community. Uh, we published uh, uh, a couple of years ago a paper with Matthias Mann, uh, where we compare the expression of proteins and RNA in different cell lines. And in this paper, we showed a very good uh, correlation between these two. Uh, there was a recent paper by Bernard Kuster in Nature, uh, where, they, where he also uh, confirmed that there is a good correlation between uh, RNA and proteins. Uh, but one has to do, say this with some caution, because there are uh, many, many exceptions to the rule, uh, and I think that what we find is that the RNA expression gives us good hints about if a protein is expressed at high levels or not, but one really has to go to the protein level to actually prove if the protein is there or not. So we just have a, a minute or two left for the webinar, and uh, I just want to give you a, a slightly broader question, perhaps. Uh, how do you see the protein atlas being applied um, specifically for disease research um, in the, going forward and, and in the future? Well, obviously, since the proteins are the targets for more or less all drugs, obviously I think it is interesting to get a systematic and relatively holistic view of where the proteins are in the, in the different parts of the human body. But obviously this is just uh, one of the uh, sort of... Um, information that you need in order to help out and, 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 and develop drugs or, or develop treatments. Uh, interaction of proteins are very important. Modification of proteins that we mentioned earlier are very important. But the spatial, uh, the spatial resolution and, this, and how the proteins are expressed in a different part of, is also, we think, very valuable. Uh, and I, I think this hopefully then can lead other scientists and, uh, around the world to then focus on analyzing what are the proteins involved in kidney disease and what are the proteins involved in liver disease and so on. Great. And uh, just to finish up, uh, I did get a couple of questions uh, from people possibly joining the webinar late asking about how they access um, the protein atlas, so perhaps you could mention that, and also how they might uh, track updates um, for releases of uh, new protein atlas versions. 
So what we have uh, done is that we have uh, one release uh, every year, or in some cases every uh, two every year. Uh, and uh, the atlas uh, you can access by by just Google Protein Atlas, or you can actually go to the www.proteinatlas.org. Uh, and then when you get to the home page, then you can go into the different chapters that shows you the liver proteome and the secretome and, and, and so on. Uh, but I think the, the way to go there is to go to proteinatlas.org. Fantastic. Well, uh, unfortunately, we are out of time for this webinar. So on behalf of myself and our viewing audience, I wanted to thank our speakers very much for being with us today, Dr. Matthias Uhlen from the Royal Institute of Technology and Dr. Cecilia Linskog from uh, Uppsala University. Uh, please go to the URL now at the bottom of your slide viewer to learn more about resources related to today's discussion and look out for more webinars from science available at webinar.sciencemag.org. This particular webinar will be made available to view again as an on-demand presentation within approximately 48 hours from now. We are interested to know what you thought of the webinar. Send us an email at the address now up in your slide viewer, webinar at AAAS.org. Once again, thank you so much to our panel for being with us and for sharing their expertise uh, and to Atlas Antibodies for their kind sponsorship of today's educational seminar. Goodbye. <laughs>